So in this account, we're going to make sure to spend the least amount of money or no money. And I will let you know when something will cost you some money. But nonetheless, it is a good idea to set up a billing budget so that we know when we go over spending some money and we can get alerted in case of that. So what I'm going to do is click on my account and then click on my billing dashboard. Now, as you can see, I need permissions. And this is because I'm logged in as an IM user on my account and we need to change something on the root account before we get access with IM users, even administrators, to the billing and cost management dashboard. So to solve this, I logged in as my root account. So as you can see now, it just says my account number, it doesn't say the IM user. So I'm logged in as my root account. And then I click on my account. So you need to be a root account to do this. You scroll down and you're going to find this one setting called IM user and role access to billing information. And we'll edit this and we'll activate IM access. And this will allow IM users who are administrators to access billing data. If you don't want that, you can also set up a billing alarm using the root account if you wanted to. But I want to show you how to set up a billing alarm using an IM user in case this is something you wanted to do. So once the setting is activated, you can go back into your IM user and then refresh this page. So here we are in the AWS billing dashboard home. And this is where you can see the charges for your month. We do the best to remain within the free tier, but sometimes if you have any charge, you would see it here. And then let me show you how you can find the source of your charge. So if you go on the left-hand side into bills and you are on this bills page, just click on try the new bills page experience to get to this interface. Okay, so once we are here in this interface, you would see your grand total, and then you can scroll down and you can go to charges by service. And this is to see which service is incurring you some charges. So for example, if I go and scroll down and go into my Elastic Compute Cloud service, I can see that 62 cents were incurred in the US East Northern Virginia region. So I click on it and open this in a new page. And on the new UI, I see that yes, this is the charge and it comes from the EBS part of it. So this is the usage description and it says that I've been using a six gigabyte month of the GP2 type of EBS volume. So this information is enough for me to figure out that I've probably left a volume unused in my accounts. So I will go into the Elastic Compute Cloud console. I would switch to the Northern Virginia region using the top right hand side drop down. And then I will go into the EBS section and delete this volume that's been incurring charges to me. So it's up to you, of course, to debug your own cost. And so this is the way you would do it. Also, if you go over the free tier, this is going to be on the left hand side. So if you go on the left hand side, you will see all your services as well as what is the free tier usage and your current usage. So you know right away if you are, for example, at 100% of your free tier or if you're about to hit it and so on. So this really helps you to understand what you've been doing wrong as well. Now, to get alerts about your upcoming costs, the best thing to do is to go into creating an AWS budget. So I am now in the budget console and I'm going to create a budget in here so that we can track our cost and we can make sure we receive alerts if we're about to hit our limits. So here are some templates. So we have user templates and then we can go into a zero spend budget that creates a budget that notifies you once you spending exceed the free tier limits. So in that case, I will have my, my zero spend budget. This is good. And we can have email recipients. So stefan at example.com. And then you will be notified by email for any spend is incurred. So let's create this budget. And that's one budget right here. And then I can create a second budget if I wanted to. And again, we're going to use a simplified template and we're going to go for monthly cost budgets. And this is the amount of cost that we want to budget for our cloud. So for example, I can say that I don't want to spend any more than $10. So I put 10 here and then the email receptions. So again, stefanexample.com. And then I will be notified actually if my actual spend reaches 85% or 100% or if my forecasted spend is expected to reach 100%. So this is another way to set a budget. And let's click on Create Budget. And we're good to go. So that's it. Of course, my zero spend budget has been exceeded because I am already in an account that has been some charges. So as you can see, we have an alert and I would receive an email. And so that's it. With this, you know how to explore your bills. You know how to explore your free tier. You know how to set up a budget 
so that you can track your cost for monthly uh, budget costs or for future costs. And that should be enough for you to control your costs in this course. Okay, I hope you like this lecture and I will see you in the next lecture. And on EC2, in which we will create our first website on AWS. So what is Amazon EC2? Well, EC2 is one of the most popular of AWS offering. It is definitely used everywhere. And what is it? Well, it stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. And this is the way to do infrastructure as a service on AWS. So EC2 is not just one service, it's composed of many things at a high level. So you can rent virtual machines on EC2, they're called EC2 instances. You can store data on virtual drives or EBS volumes. You can distribute load across machines, Elastic Load Balancer. You can scale services using an auto-scaling group or ASG. And all these things, do not worry, we will see in depth during this course. Knowing how to use EC2 in AWS is fundamental to understand how the cloud works because as I said from before, the cloud is to be able to rent the compute whenever you need on demand and EC2 is just that. So EC2, what can we choose for our instances? So our virtual servers that we rent from AWS. So what operating system can we choose for our EC2 instances? Three options, Linux, and it's going to be the most popular, Windows, or even Mac OS. How much compute power and cores you want on this virtual machine? So how much CPU? Then you need to choose how much random access memory or RAM you want and how much storage space. So for example, do you want storage is going to be attached through the network and we'll see about it with EBS or EFS or do you want it to be hardware attached? In this case, it will be an EC2 instant store and with a whole section on storage, so don't worry about it. And then finally, the type of network you want attached to your EC2 instance. So do you want a network card that's going to be fast? What kind of public IP do you want? And finally, we need to handle the firewall rules of our EC2 instance, and that is the security group. And I lied, finally, finally, there's the bootstrap script to configure the instance at first launch, which is called the EC2 user data. So we have lots and lots of options, and as you'll see in the hands-on, even more options at other certification levels that you need to know in EC2 instances. But at the core of it, what you need to remember is that you can choose pretty much how you want your virtual machine to be, and you can rent it from AWS, and that is the power of the cloud. You can do this by just um, in the blink of an eye, really. So it is possible to bootstrap our instances using the EC2 user data script. So what does bootstrapping mean? Well, bootstrapping means launching commands when the machine starts. So that script is only run once and when it first starts and then will never be run again. So the EC2 user data has a very specific purpose. It is to automate boot tasks, hence the name bootstrapping. So what tasks do you want to automate usually when you boot your instance? Well, you want to install updates, install software, download common files from the internet, or anything you can think of, really. Anything you can think of. So it could be whatever you want. But just know that the more you add into your user data script, the more your instance has to do at boot time. Simple, right? By the way, the EC2 user data scripts runs with the root user. So any command you have will have the pseudo rights, okay? What type of instances do we get for EC2? And this is an example I have hundreds and hundreds of EC2 instance types, but here are five for you. So the first one is a T2 micro, very, very simple. It has one vCPU, one, mem uh, one gigabyte of memory. The storage is only for EBS and has a low to moderate network performance. But as soon as you increase the instance type, for example, if we stay in the same family, so we stay in the T2 family, but we go to T2X large, now we have access to four vCPU, 16 megabytes of RAM, uh, gigabytes of RAM, sorry, and network performance of moderate. If we go to completely different new levels, so C5D4X large, which is a very complicated name, you get 16 vCPU, so 16 cores, you get 32 gigabytes of memory, so a lot more. You get some storage that is attached to your EC2 instance. This is why it says 400 NVMe SSD. Now the network is gonna get really good, up to 10 gigabytes, as well as the bandwidth to talk to network storage. And so as you can see, if you go to R5, 16X large or M5, 8X large, again, you have different characteristics. So the idea with this is that you choose the kind of instance that fits best your application, and you can use that on the cloud on demand, okay? Now for this instance, for our course, 
T2 Micro is going to be part of the AWS free tier. You can get up to 750 hours per month of T2 Micro, which represents basically running that instance continuously for a month. And so this is what we'll be using in the hands-on that comes in the next lecture. So this is, was a short introduction to EC2. Don't worry, it's going to get very, very practical very soon. I will see you in the next lecture. Welcome. So in this lecture, we are going to launch our first EC2 instance running Amazon Linux. So for this, we'll be launching our first EC2 instance, which is, well, a virtual server, and we'll use the console for this. We'll get a high-level approach to all the various parameters you have when launching an EC2 instance, and you'll see there are many, but we'll learn the most important ones. And then we will launch a web server directly on the EC2 instance using a piece of code we will pass to the EC2 instance that is called the user data. Finally, we'll learn how to start, stop, and terminate our instance. So let's get started and launch our first EC2 instance. For this, I'm gonna go into the EC2 console, then I will click on instances, and then click on launch instances. So in there, I'm able to launch my first EC2 instance. And to do so, I need to add a name and tags. So the name is going to be my first instance, and that is an app, that is the name tag. And if you wanted to add additional tags to tag your instance differently, then you could click there. But you don't need to click on this. Using just name as my first instance is good enough. Next, you need to choose a base image for your EC2 instance. This is the operating system of your instance. As you can see, there's a full catalog that you can search from, but we're going to use the ones from the quick start that are very, very helpful. And the one we'll be using is the Amazon Linux which is provided by AWS. So in it, I will choose the Amazon Linux 2 AMI. And as you can see, that one is free tier eligible. So we'll just leave it as is. So this gives me an Amazon Linux 2. And the architecture I will choose is 64-bit x86. So everything left pretty much as the default. And we'll see in this uh, section and moreover and the other ones that you can create your own AMIs and you can find them in here. Okay, but currently we're just going to use the ones provided by AWS as quick start. Next, we need to choose an instance type. And so instance types are going to differ based on the number of CPUs they have, the amount of memory they have, and how much they cost. As you can see right now, I have a T2 macro selected. This one is free tier eligible, so it will be free to launch one of them during an entire month if we leave it running. So this is what we'll be using. But in here, you could scroll down and look at other types of instances. For example, T1 Micro is also free tier eligible, but that's older generation. And as you can see, you have a bunch of instances right here available to you. Some of them are going to be free tier eligible. Some of them will not. And by default, the one that's going to be free tier eligible is a T2 Micro, so we'll be using that one a lot. If you wanted to compare the instance types, you would just click on that link and it shows you all the type of instances in here as well as how much memory they have and so on. So right now we'll be using a T2 micro. Okay, next a key pair to log into your instance. So this is necessary if we use the SSH utility to access our instance and we will be using the SSH utility in this course. Therefore, it is required for us to create a key pair. So as we can see right now, there is no key pair and we cannot prov uh, we could proceed without a key pair, but for now we won't do this. So let's go ahead and create a new key pair and the name is going to be EC2 Tutorial. Then you need to have, choose a key pair type. So we'll be using the RSA encrypted. Okay, this is good. And then the key pair format. So if you have Mac or Linux or Windows 10, then you can use the .pem format. If you have Windows less than version 10, for example, Windows 7 or Windows 8, then you can do a little shortcut and directly use a PPK, which is going to be used for PuTTY, and PuTTY is how you do SSH on Windows 7 and Windows 8. So remember, anything else but Windows 7 and Windows 8, choose .pem, else use PPK. Okay, I should be clear enough. I'm going to create this key pair and it is downloaded for me directly. So now it is selected automatically here. Next, we have to go into network settings. So for now, I will not touch anything. My instance is going to get and public IP, and then we need to connect to our instance. And so for this, there is going to be a security group attached to our instance, which is going to control the traffic from and to our instance. And therefore, we can add rules. And 
the first security group uh, created will be called launch wizard one, so created by the console directly, and we can define multiple rules. So the first rule we want to have is to allow SSH traffic from anywhere. So we leave it as is, and this will create a rule in our security group to allow SSH traffic. But we also want to allow HTTP traffic from the internet, so we'll take that box, and this is because we're going to launch a web server on our EC2 instance, so we need it as well. As we're not going to use HTTPS for now, we don't need to take the second box. Let's configure the storage. So then we can configure the storage. And as we can see, we have an 8 gigabit GP2 root volume that we'll leave it as is, okay? Because in the free tier, we can get up to 30 gigabytes of EBS general purpose SSD storage. So this is good. And we only have one volume necessary. If you go into advanced, you could configure them and see a little bit more information, okay? And the one important thing to note in here is the delete on termination. By default, it is enabled to yes. I just did advanced to show you that one detail, okay? That means that once we terminate our EC2 instance, then that volume is also going to be deleted. Okay, so we leave everything as is and we'll be, get back into the simple mode. Okay, next for advanced details, this is where it gets interesting. So I will skip spot, I will skip IM instance profile. Don't worry, I will go over them once we need to explore them. I will skip all of that. So let's scroll down, let's scroll down, let's scroll down all the way to the bottom. And at the bottom, there is user data. User data is when we pass a script, so some commands to our EC2 instance to execute on the first launch of our EC2 instance and only the first launch. And therefore, on the first launch, we want to be able to pass these commands right here. So for this, you go into your code, you go to the EC2 fundamentals, and then the EC2 user.sh uh, file, you copy entirely this, so all of it, and then you paste it here. So you paste everything, and that means that this script is going to be executed when the instance is first started and only once, okay, in the whole lifecycle of the instance. And what it's going to do is that it's going to update a few things, then install the HTTPD web server on the machine, and then write a file, an HTML file, that will be our web server. And so you don't need to know code or know these commands, okay? This is provided to you to illustrate a few things on this lecture. So finally, for summary, we want to start one instance. This is great. And we can review everything we have here. It all looks good. We are very happy. And as you can see, in the free tier, we get a first uh, year of 750 hours of T2 Micro, which is running it, running it for one month. So that's every month. And if you, if you don't have a T2 Micro in your region, then it's going to be a T3 Micro, okay? And then also we get 30 gigabytes of EBS storage and so on. So let's launch this instance. And the instance is going to be launched. Let's go to view all instances refresh, and now my instance is in pending state. So it's going to take about 10, 15 seconds for the instance to come up. And this is the whole power of the cloud. Thanks to the cloud, I am able to create an instance or 100 of them very quickly in less than 10 seconds without me owning any single server. So that is extremely powerful. And we just scratched the surface of the power of the cloud, obviously, because the course is just getting started. But you can get a feeling of the advances and the speed we can have on the cloud thanks to this. So as you can see now, my instance is running. And right now, I want to show you a few things, OK? The first one is that the instance name is my first instance. And there is an instance ID, which is just a unique identifier for my instance. There is a public IPv4 address. This is what we're going to use to access our EC2 instance. Or there is a private IPv4 address, which is how to access that instance internally on the AWS network, which is private. The instance is running, and we get some information around host name, private DNS, which instance that we have, so a T2 micro, as well as, if you scroll down, the AMI we're using, which is Amazon Linux 2, and the key pair we're using, which is EC2 tutorial, OK? So you can have a look at a few details in here. Um, you have more information, for example, on security. We get some information on the security group, which was created called Launch Wizard 1, with these inbound rules. So port 22 accessible from everywhere and port 80 accessible from everywhere. So you should have something similar. 
Okay, if you don't start over because you probably missed a step. And the advanced rule allowing all communication outwards, which allows the instance to access the internet. For storage, we saw that yes, we created one volume of eight gigabytes, so we're good to go. So now let's have a look at the web server running on my instance. And for this, you go on public IP for address, you copy this, or you click on open address. And as you can see, it doesn't work. Or if you click on it, copy, and then paste it, you press enter, it's going to work. So it depends on the web browsers you have and so on, okay? But the reason it doesn't work here is that in the URL, you need to make sure that you're using the HTTP protocol. So HTTP colon slash slash and then the IP. Because if you use HTTPS, this is not going to work. It's going to give you an infinite loading screen, which is what's happening right here. So please make sure to use HTTP colon slash slash and then the IP address, and you're going to get this screen. And in programming, when you do something for the first time, you usually say hello world. So this web server is selling hello world from and this IP right here, which is not the public IP, this IP right here, 172.31.33.135, 135, actually corresponds to the private IP before address. So this is something that I program myself. So we use the public IP address to access it, but we have the private IP address in here and we have the hello world. And if you go too fast, you're going to get no messages. So if you go too fast, just wait five minutes, get back to it, refresh this page, and you'll see it. Okay, so cool, we have a web server running. This is great. Now let's explore a few options. So we have an EC2 instance and it's running, but if we don't need it, we can go to instance state and then click on stop instance. And in the cloud, you can start and stop instances just as you wish. And why would you stop an instance? Well, the longer you leave it running, the more you're going to pay, of course. But if you decide to stop an instance, then AWS will not bill you for it. The instance state is kept because you have a volume attached to it, but at least you're not paying for it. So you can see right now, well, the instance is in a stopping state. And if we try to refresh this page, it's going to, of course, it's not going to work because, well, you don't have the server running anymore. So you can see it gets to some like infinite loading experience, okay? So my instance is now stopped. And if I wanted to, actually, I could get rid of it. And in the cloud, it's very common to start instances and then get rid of them very quickly just to try it out because this is the cloud and we can do whatever we want. So we can do instance state and then terminate instance. Um, if we do so, we're going to get a, a warning message and don't click on terminate because I want to keep this instance with me, okay? But this is how we would get rid of it. So I cancel this. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start my instance again. So I go to instance state and then start instance. And now as you can see, the state is pending. So it is getting started. And I just wait for it to be started in the green state. And I will show you something very interesting. Okay, so my instance is now running. And if I go here and stop the refresh and try again to refresh, as you can see, it still goes into an infinite loop. Well, you may say, well, the server is running, Stefan, so why is it not displaying the message now? It is displaying here, but like from the old one, of course. So here, the IP start with 54, right? But here, if you click on here, now the public IP start with 3.250. So the public IP actually has changed. So if you stop an instance and then you start it later on, then AWS will maybe change its public IPv4. So therefore, you need to copy the new IPv4, make sure to use HTTP, and voila, we have access back to our EC2 instance. But one thing that has not changed is the private IPv4. The private IP will always stay the same, but the public IPv4 may change, okay? So, well, so that's it for this hands-on. We have seen quite a lot of things. We've launched our first EC2 instance, which is very exciting, our first web server in the cloud. We've had to look at some of the power of the cloud. You're just using some API calls to stop an instance, start an instance, and so on. So I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, so now let's talk about EC2 instance types. So there are different types of EC2 instances that you can use for different use cases, and they have different types of optimization. And let's go check out this link, and we'll see we have, uh, for now, seven different types of EC2 instances. So this website on the AWS website is what we were interested into. And as we can see, we have different types of instances. We have general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized, and so on. And so for each type of instance, we have different families. And so as we can see, this website is going to be the reference for us to uh, look at EC2 instance types and know their cost and know their specificity. 
What I'm going to do, though, is just walk you through a high-level overview of how they work in AWS. AWS will have the following naming convention. For example, we'll be talking about an M5.2x large type of instance. What does that mean? Well, M is going to be called the instance class, okay? And this is going to be, for example, in this case, a general purpose type of instance. Five is the generation of the instance. So as it was improves the hardware over time, it will release a new generation of hardware. And so after M5, if they improve the M type of instance class, then it will go to M6. And then finally, the 2x large represent the size within the instance class. So uh, it starts as small and then large and then 2x large, 4x large, and so on. So it represents the size of the instance. And the more the size, the more the memory, the more the CPU you're going to have on your instance. So from an exam perspective, what do you need to know? Well, we'll talk about a few different types of instance types. So you have general purpose, and these are great for a diversity of workloads, such as web servers or code repositories. They will have a good balance between compute, memory, networking. And so in this course, we'll be using general purpose instances. We'll be using the T2 Micro, which is the free tier general purpose type of instance. On the website that I just showed you, you will see all the different types of instance that are general purpose. And this is going to evolve over time, so I won't update this slide. But you can always refer back to the AWS website to check what the instances are in the general purpose type of uh, family. Then we have compute optimized. And these are instances that are great and optimized for compute intensive tasks. So what requires a high level of, pr of processor? Well, for example, it could be if you're batch processing some data if you're doing media transcoding, if you need high-performance web servers, if you're doing high-performance computing, it's called HPC, if you're doing machine learning, or if you have a dedicated gaming server. So all these things are tasks that require a very good CPU, a very good compute side, and so EC2 instances do have this kind of uh, particularity. And for now, all the compute-optimized instances in EC2 are of the C uh, name, so C5, C6, and so on. Next, we have some EC2 instances that are memory optimized, and they are going to be have a really fast performance for the type of workloads that will process large data sets in memory. So memory means RAM, and so the use cases are this is going to be high performance for relational or non-relational databases that are mostly going to be in-memory databases. Distributed web scale cache store, so for Elastic Cache, for example, in-memory databases that are optimized for business intelligence, or BI, and applications performing real-time processing of big unstructured data. So in terms of the names for the memory-optimized instances, there's going to be the R series, because R stands for RAM, but there's also going to be X1, high memory, and Z1. Again, you don't need to remember the name of the instances, but good to know at a high level. Okay, and finally, we'll have storage-optimized instances, they're great when you are accessing a lot of data sets on the local storage. And so the use cases for storage optimized instances are going to be high frequency online transaction processing, so OLTP systems, relational and NoSQL databases, and we'll see those in details when we get to the database sections, cache for in-memory databases, for example, Redis, data warehousing application, distributed file systems, and the storage optimized instances in AWS will start with an I, a D, or H1, okay? But again, don't have to remember this, I'm just giving you examples. So what does it mean? Let's compare a few instance types. So for example, for T2 Micro, we have one vCPU and one memory, one uh, gigabytes of memory. And if you look, for example, at the R5 16X large, we have 16 vCPU and 512 gigabytes of memory. So we can see there's a lot of more emphasis on the memory. If we compare it, for example, to a C5D 4X large, we can see we have 16 vCPU and 32 gigabytes of memory. So less memory, more CPU, and so on different network performance, different EBS bandwidth, and so on. So just to give you a point of comparison. And because we're using T2 Micro in this course, it is part of the AWS free tier. So we get up to 750 hours per month of T2 Micro. And if you wanted a website to compare all the EC2 instances together, there's one that I really like. It's called ec2instances.info. And I'll show it to you right now. So I am on the EC2 instances.info website. And as we can see, we have a list of all the instances available in AWS. So really a lot. We also get some information around the Linux on-demand cost and Linux reserves cost and so on. So some cost information. We get information around the memory, the number of vCPU, 
Uh, we can order by name, we can search it. So it's it's quite handy and I really like this website. And if you go and use AWS, you probably will use this website as well. So that's it for this lecture. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture. Let's talk about these firewalls around our EC2 instances. So we briefly configured one in the previous lecture, but security groups yet again are going to be fundamental into doing network security in the AWS cloud. They will control how the traffic is allowed into and out of your EC2 instances. Security groups are going to be very easy. They only contain allow rules, so we can say what is allowed to go in and to go out. And security groups can have rules that reference either by IP addresses, so where your computer is from, or by other security groups. So as well, C security groups can reference each other. So here, let's take an example. We are on our computer, so we are on the public internet, and we're trying to access our EC2 instance from our computer. We are going to create a security group around our EC2 instance, that is the firewall that is around it, and then this security group is going to have rules. And these rules are going to say whether or not some inbound traffic, so from the outside into the EC2 instance is allowed, and also if the EC2 instance can perform some outbound traffic, so to talk from where it is into the internet. Now, let's do a deeper dive, right? Security groups are a firewall on our EC2 instances, and they're going to really get regulate access to ports. They're going to see the authorized IP ranges. Would it be on IPv4 or IPv6? These are the two kinds of IP on the internet. This is going to control the inbound network, so from the outside to the instance, and the outbound network from the instance to the outside. And when we look at security group rules, they will look just like this. So they will be the type, the protocol, so TCP, the port allowing it, so where the traffic can go through on the instance, and the source which represents an IP address range. And 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 means everything, and this is here means just one IP. So you're not expected to know how to properly configure a security group for the cloud partitioner exam, but they're so important, so I want to talk about them. Now let's look at the diagram, right? So we have our EC2 instance, and it has one security group allow, uh, attached to it, that has inbound rules and outbound rules. So I've separated them onto the diagram. So our computer is going to be authorized on say port 22. So the traffic can go through from our computer to the EC2 instance. But someone else's computer that's not using my IP address because they don't live where I live, then if they try to access our EC2 instance, they will not get through it because the firewall is going to block it and it will be a timeout. Then for the outbound rules by default, our EC2 instance for any security group is going to be by default allowing any traffic out of it. So our EC2 instance, if it tries to access a website and initiate a connection, it is going to be allowed by the security group. So this is the basics of how a firewall works. Now, good to know. What do you need to know with security groups? Well, they can be attached to multiple instances, okay? There's not a one-to-one -one relationship between security group and instances. And actually, an instance can have multiple security groups too. Security groups are locked down to a region slash VPC combination, okay? So if you switch to another region, you have to create a new security group, or if you create another VPC, and we'll see what VPCs are in, in the like, later lecture, well, you have to recreate the security groups. The, the security groups live outside the EC2, so as I said, if the traffic is blocked, the EC2 instance won't even see it, okay? It's not like an application running on EC2, it's really a firewall outside your EC2 instance. To be honest, and that's just an advice to you from developer to developer, but it's good to maintain one separate security group just for SSH access. Usually SSH access is the most complicated thing and you really want to make sure that one is done correctly. So I usually separate my security group for SSH access separately. If your application is not accessible, so timeout, so we saw this in the last lecture, then it is a security group issue, okay? So if you try to connect to any port and your computer just hangs and waits and waits, that's probably a security group issue. But if you receive a connection refused error, okay, you actually get a, a response saying connection refused, then the security group actually worked, the traffic went through, and the application was errored or it wasn't launched or something like this. So this is what you would get if you get a connection refused. By default, all inbound traffic is blocked and all outbound traffic is authorized. Okay, now there is a small advanced feature that I really, really like, and I think it's perfect if you start using load balancers, and we'll see this in the next lecture as well, which is how to reference security groups from other security groups. So let me explain things. So we have an EC2 instance, 
and it has a security group, what I call group number one. And the inbound rules is basically saying, I'm authorizing security group number one inbound and security group number two. So why would we even do this? Well, if we launch another EC2 instance and it has security group two attached to it, well, by using the security group run rule that we just set up, we basically allow our EC2 instance to go connect straight through on the port we decided onto our first EC2 instance. Similarly, if we have another EC2 instance with a security group one attached, well, we've also authorized this one to communicate straight back to our instances. And so regardless of the IP of our EC2 instances, because they have the right security group attached to them, they're able to communicate straight through to other instances. And that's awesome because it doesn't make you think about IPs all the time. And if you have another EC2 instance, maybe with security group number three attached to it, well, because group number three wasn't uh, authorized in the inbound roles of security group number one, then it's being denied and things don't work. So that's a bit of an advanced feature, uh, but we'll see it when we'll deal with load balancers because it's quite a common pattern. I just want you to know about it. Again, just remember this diagram. And by now, you should be really, really good at security groups and understand them correctly. Now, going into the exam, what ports you need to know? Well, we need to know something called SSH or Secure Shell, and we're going to see this in the very next lectures. This is the port 22, and this allows you to log into an EC2 instance on Linux. You have port 21 for FTP or File Transfer Protocol, which is to use, used to upload files into a file share. And you have SFTP, which is also using port 22. Why? Well, because we're going to upload file, but this time using SSH because it's going to be a secure file transfer protocol. Then we have port 80 for HTTP, and we've been using it in the previous lecture. This is to access unsecured websites. And you've seen this whenever you go on the internet and you enter HTTP colon slash slash, and then the address of the website. And you've seen most likely a lot more like this. You've seen HTTPS, which is to access secured websites, which are the standard nowadays. And for HTTPS, it is port 443. Finally, the last port you need to remember is 3389 for RDP or the Remote Desktop Protocol, which is the port that's used to log into a Windows instance. Okay, so 22 is SSH for a Linux instance, but 3389 is RDP for a Windows instance. Now, this is all the theory about security groups. I will see you in the next lecture for some practice. So we've launched our EC2 instance, and now let's have a look at security groups. So we have a short idea of security groups by just clicking on security in here, and we get some overview of the security groups attached to our instance, as well as the inbound rules and the outbound rules. But what I will do is that I will just access the more complete page of security groups from the left-hand side menu. So under network and security, you click on security group. And we can see so far that we have two security groups in our uh, console so far. So the default security group that is created by default, as well as the launch wizard one, which is the first security group that was created when we created our EC2 instance. And so a security group has an ID, so an identifier, just like an EC2 instance has an ID. And then we can check the inbound rules. So the inbound rules are the rules that allows connectivity from the outside into the EC2 instance. And as we can see, we have two inbound rules in here. And the first one is of type SSH, which allows port 22 in our instance. And let me just click on edit my rules to see better. So set first one is SSH on port 22 from anywhere. So 000 slash 0 is anywhere. And the second one is HTTP from port 80 again, anywhere. So this rule right here is what allowed us to access our web server. So if you go back to the EC2 console, go to our instance, and we were doing this IPv4 address, okay? So we were opening it as an HTTP website. This worked thanks to this rule port 80. Let's verify this. So if we delete this rule on port 80 and save the rules, as we can see now, we only have port 22. So if I go back to this and refresh my page, now, as you can see, there's an infinite loading screen right here on the top of my screen, which shows that, well, indeed, I don't have access to my EC2 instance. So here is a very important tip for you. Anytime you see a timeout, okay, this is a timeout because it keeps on trying to connect, but it doesn't succeed, and then it will eventually fail called a timeout. So if you see a timeout when trying to establish any kind of connection into 
your EC2 instances. For example, if you try to SSH into it, but there's a timeout, or if you try to do an HTTP query, but there's a timeout, or if you try to do anything with it, and there is a timeout, this is 100% the cause of an EC2 security group, okay? So in that case, go to your security group rules and make sure that they are correct, because if they're not correct, then you will get a timeout. So to fix this, we can add back a rule. We will do HTTP, which allows to get port 80 in here automatically. And then from anywhere, IPv6, uh, IPv4, excuse me, right here, which allows this block right here. We save the rule. Now the rule is done. If I go back to my page and refresh, as you can see, now it is fully working. So this inbound rule really did the trick. But we could add any sort of inbound rule. So we could define the port or the port range that we want to. So we could say, for example, uh, any port we want, for example, 443, which is HTTPS, or choose directly from a drop down here as a little shortcut, the type of protocol you want. For example, HTTPS is 443 automatically. And then you can define where you want to allow from. So you have different CIDR blocks and we don't need to use them right now or security groups or prefix list, but we'll get to see them later on, okay, in this course. For now, just know that you could have either a custom CIDR anywhere which adds this blog, or if you want, you can select my IP to only allow access to your IP, but just be wary that if your IP changes, then you will get a timeout and will not be able to access your EC2 instance. Finally, one last bit of information. So we can have a look at outbound rules. So we allow all traffic on IPv4 to anywhere. So this allows our uh, uh, EC2 instance to get full internet connectivity anywhere. And something that you know, so we have two security groups right here, default and launch wizard. And an EC2 instance can have many security groups attached to it. So it can attach one, but two or three, if you want, maybe five security groups. And the rules will just add on to each other. And also this security group we have created from before. So for example, this launch wizard one, can be attached to other EC2 instances, okay? So you can attach as many security groups as you want, as well as as many EC2 instances as you want to one security group. That's it for this lecture. I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next lecture. We are getting to one of the trickier bits of running in the cloud, which is how do you connect inside of your servers to perform some maintenance or action? So for this, for Linux servers, we can use SSH to do a secure shell into our servers. So based on the operating system you have on your computer, you have different ways of achieving it. So I've separated Mac, Linux, Windows before version 10 and Windows after version 10. So the SSH is a command line interface utility that can be used on Mac or Linux, as well as Windows over version 10. Then if you have Windows less than version 10, you can use something called PuTTY. PuTTY will achieve the exact same thing as SSH. So when I say you should SSH, if you're on Windows, you can use PuTTY. And PuTTY is valid for any version of Windows. They do the exact same thing. They allow you to use the SSH protocol to connect into your EC2 instances. And then finally, there is something new called the EC2 Instance Connect, which is going to use your web browser, so not a terminal, not PuTTY, your web browser to connect to your EC2 instance. And I like it a lot because it is valid for Mac, Linux, Windows, all versions, okay? The cool thing about EC2 Instance Connect is that it works, but it only works for now with Amazon Linux 2. And this is why I've been using Amazon Linux 2 in this tutorial. So now what should you do? If you are on Mac or on Linux, then please watch the SSH lecture on Mac Linux. If you're on Windows, then you can either watch the PuTTY lecture, or if you have Windows 10, then I have created an SSH on Windows 10 lecture as well. Regardless, I am going to personally use in the future lectures, EC2 Instance Connect. So if you wanna have a look and play with it, I find it really simple. You don't need to install anything or use the command line interface if you're not familiar with it. So this could be very handy for all of you. Nonetheless, SSH is, in my experience, and I've taught hundreds of thousands of students, what caused the most troubles in this course. So if you get a problem with SSH, you can rewatch the lecture. You may have missed something, maybe a security group rule, maybe a command, maybe a typo, I don't know. You, there's also a troubleshooting guide that I've put together after these lectures, so have a look. I would recommend to try EC2 Instance Connect as well. It sometimes fixes all problems. And if none of these methods works, so sorry, if one method works, 
then you're good to go, okay? You don't need to have them all working. If one works, you're good to go. And if no method works, that's completely okay. This course is just introductory and it won't use SSH much and you'll be fine, okay? So that's it just for the introduction. Now find your right lecture and I will see you in the next lecture. All right, so now we're going to SSH into our EC2 instance using our Linux or a Mac computer. And you may say, what the hell is SSH? What are you talking about, Stefan? Well, SSH is one of the most important functions when you deal with Amazon Cloud. It basically allows you to control a remote machine or server all using your terminal or your command line. So how does that look like with a diagram? Well, we have our EC2 machine and we launched Amazon Linux 2 on it, and our machine has a public IP. Now we want to access that machine. And so for this, I don't know if you remember, but we have a security group and on it, we allowed the port 22 of SSH. So what's going to happen is that our computer, so my laptop for you, for me or whatever for you, then will access over the web through that port 22, it will access the EC2 machine. And basically our command line interface is going to be just as if we were inside that machine. So let's get started. Okay, so we are going to SSH into our instance. So remember that PEM file you've downloaded called ec2tutorial.pem. Please make sure to remove the space in it. If you have a space, even if you have a PPK file, please rename it and remove the space from it. So ec2tutorial.pem is removed for me. And then you go ahead and place it in a directory you like. So for me, I took my file and I pasted it and I placed it in a folder called AWS course, okay? So this is the first step to making sure you are ready. So next, what I'm going to do is that I am going to go in my EC2 instance overview uh, page and find my first instance. So here we have my first instance and we're going to SSH into it. So we're going to open a remote terminal into it. And for this, I need to get the public IPv4 address so I can copy this and I will use it later. The other thing I need to do is to look at the security of my instance. So again, if you did everything with me, then your security groups have this rule in it called port 22, which is the SSH port from anywhere by 0000 slash 0. Okay, so if you have that rule, then you're good to go. If not, please click on the security group and add the missing rule. Next, I need to try to do an SSH. So first of all, you do SSH EC2 user at and then the IP you have. So the reason we do SSH EC2 minus user is because the Amazon Linux 2 AMI has one user already set up for us and that user is named EC2 user. Then we have at to say that we want to access that user on a specific server. And then we have the IP right here. This is the public IP of our EC2 instance. So we try this, so we do SSH and then we're going to get a too many authentication failure. So that means that we don't authenticate into our EC2 instance. Well, that makes sense because we haven't specified the key that we downloaded from before yet, okay? You may get another kind of error, but right now this is the one I get. So for this, we need to reference the file we just downloaded called ec2tutorial.pem, okay, into our command. So make sure again, there is no space. And then you need to make sure your terminal is exactly where your file is. So if I do ls right here to list the files in my folder, and I'm sorry if this is too advanced for you, but I have to cover the grounds for everyone. So if I do ls, as you see right now, it says ec2tutorial.pem. That's because I placed my command line in the correct directory on my computer, okay? So for this, if you were not in the correct directory, for example, if I was one level up, so I do cd dot dot, which puts me one level up, then I do ls, of course, I don't see my uh, ec 2 tutorialpem okay? So to do so, what you can do is just check where you are. So pwd is where you are. So I'm in users Stefan Merrick, and I know that I placed my folder AWS course within my home. So right under user Stefan Merrick, there is AWS course. So for this, then I know that I can do ls or ll just to confirm that my folder exists. As you can see, right here is my AWS course folder. So this is good. So what I do is I will do CD and then AWS course, which now puts me in the directory 
of my AWS course. So if I do PWD, I am in the correct directory. And if I do LS, I can see my EC2 tutorial at PEM file. The reason I do this is that because now in the next command, so the SSH command, you do SSH minus I, then you specify the EC2 tutorial.pem file, and that will not work if you're not in the correct directory. So please make sure to get there. And if you're missing a little bit of the Linux launch here, please try to go online. But I should be good with what I showed you. And then EC2 user at, and we reference the public IP of our instance. So this one right here, we reference it. Press enter. And now we get another kind of error which is saying that we have an unprotected key file and we need to change the permissions for it. So for that reason, we'll have to enter another command. And that command is mod, so chmod0400. And then we pass in the file itself, so ec2tutorial.pem. So I clear my screen. And then I'm going to try the exact same command as before. So let me press Enter and I am logged into my machine. So you may have seen a screen where they prompt you for yes, no to trust the instance as well. Uh, just enter yes if you do get that screen. So as you can see now I have uh, done the SSH into my instance and now it says EC2 user at this IP, which means that now all the commands are issued are going to be issued directly from the Amazon Linux 2 AMI EC2 instance that I've just launched from before. So let's try a few commands. For example, if we do who am I, then it says EC2 user, or I can ping google.com, and we see that google.com is responding to our pings. So we can launch some commands directly from the, from the Amazon X2 AMI, and I did control C to stop that command. Now to exit the instance itself, you can either tap exit, and I think it should work, or you do control D, and then it will close the connection into the EC2 instance. And if you ever want to get back into it, remember this command, SSH minus I, EC2 tutorial.pem if you are in the correct directory, please make sure to do so, as well as EC2 user at, and then the public IP of your instance. And remember that if you stop and then start your instance, then the public IP can change. So make sure to change that part as well. All right, so that's it for this lecture. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, so we are going to learn how to SSH into our EC2 instance using Windows. And for this, we used to say, what, what, what is SSH? Well, SSH to me is one of the most important functions, especially when you deal with Amazon Cloud. It will basically allow you to control a machine remotely all using the command line, okay? And so what does it look like? Well, basically we have our EC2 machine and it's running Amazon Linux 2 and it has a public IP. And I don't know if you remember, but we had an SSH security group on it and basically we allowed SSH on port 22 to any IP, which basically allows our Windows machine to connect over the internet directly into the machine and control it using the command line. So we'll see how to do the requirements for parameterizing basically our Windows, and so we'll use PuTTY to do SSH. So this is a free tool available online, and as you can see, it's a little bit tricky to use the first time, but we'll get used to it and we'll learn how to SSH into, Windows, uh, into Linux using PuTTY. So let's get started. Okay, so we are going to SSH into our EC2 instance and I'm running on Windows. And for this, I assume that you have Windows 7 or Windows 8 or older version of Windows. If you have Windows 10, there is an alternative in the next lecture. Both work, okay? So let's try for, even if you're on Windows 10, you can do this technique. So for this, you would go and download PuTTY. So PuTTY is a free SSH client for Windows. So download PuTTY. And then I will choose, for example, the 64-bit installer, the first one. Then I go ahead, I perform the install of PuTTY. So next, next, yes. And yes, I want to install PuTTY. Perfect, so PuTTY is installed. And I have to install PuTTY. So we have two, two things here on PuTTY. We have the PuTTY app as well as PuTTY gen. So let's first open PuTTY gen. And in case you did not download your file in the PPK format, you can actually generate the PPK format directly from here. So let me show you how it's done. So I need to go ahead and load my file. So I click on load and then find where my file is. So for me, it's on my desktop. And as you can see, I see nothing. But if I go to the bottom right and show all files, I will find my EC2 tutorial in the PEM format. So I can select it. It says, okay, you have successfully imported this, and then you can save it as a private key. So click on save private key. 
and say, do you want to have a bath, uh, a bath phrase? You say, uh, if you don't have a bath phrase, say yes. And then you save it on your desktop. So ec2 tutorial.ppk. Now your file is, is saved and you have converted successfully a PEM file into the PPK format. If you have done this already, then you're good to go. Next, we need to set up PuTTY to access our EC2 instance. So this time you open the PuTTY app. And here we have to enter a host name or an IP address of where we are trying to connect. So this we know, it's my first instance. You copy the public IPv4 address, you paste it and it's SSH, you're going to save this under EC2 instance, and then you click on save, but we're not done just yet, okay? We need to specify uh, the key itself, so let's specify the key in here. So you have save under EC2 instance. I double clicked, so as you can see, I have to accept this. So if we accept, because we trust the host, we say yes, accept, but we still have the login as prompt and it will not work. So if I do, for example, EC2 user, it says, okay, I cannot authenticate right now. So for this, we go back into Putty and we're going to fix things. So click on EC2 instance and load this profile. The first thing I'm going to add is in the host name, I have EC2 minus user at the IP. So the IP is where we access our server and the EC2 user is a user already created for us on Amazon Linux 2. So I can click on save again. So we're done in here, this will be saved. And then for the key, we need to go into the SSH. You click the plus, you have the auth, you click the plus, uh, excuse me, no need to click the plus, so you just click on auth, and then you need to find a private key file for authentication. Click on browse, go to your desktop, and then you find the ec2 tutorial.ppk file you have just generated using PuttyGen, or if you had downloaded it already from the AWS console, that works as well. So this file is good. Don't click on open just yet. Go back to session and then click on save to save this profile. This way you don't have to redo all these steps all at once um, over again. So you click on open. And now it says, okay, you're authenticating using the EC2 user. And we have this file we just opened. And so now we are into our Amazon Linux 2 AMI. So we have successfully performed the SSH using PuTTY. Okay, so if in the course I refer to SSH just for you, just that means you should PuTTY into the instance at least once. And now what I can do, who am I? To find that I am EC2 user or ping google.com and start running some commands. So to stop this, just do control C and it will stop the command. And then if you want to just exit this, you can just close this, exit the session and you're good to go. And let's check if you go back into PuTTY. So click back on PuTTY and you load the EC2 instance. Hopefully all your settings are saved. So you can see the top settings are saved and my SSH auth also is saved. And therefore, if I click on open, then yes, I have access directly into my EC2 instance. So we've successfully performed SSH on um, this Windows 7 or Windows 8 through PuTTY. And I will see you in the next lecture in case you have Windows 10 to show you how to SSH using Windows. So on Windows 10, we can use the SSH command. So I opened Windows PowerShell and I tap SSH. And if you see this, that means that it's available. Otherwise, you can also use the command prompt and do SSH. And if you see this, that means the command is available. If you don't see the SSH command on your uh, Windows, that means that you don't have it. And therefore, you must use the PuTTY method I just showed in the previous lecture. In my instance, I'm just going to use PowerShell to do these exercises, okay? So next, what I have to do is to actually run this SSH command. So the first thing I have to do is to be in the directory of where my PEM file is. So right now, I'm in C user Stefan Merrick, and I do ls, and as you can see, well, I don't have my PEM file because it's under for me on the desktop. So I do cd desktop to just change directory. I clear my screen. Then I do ls again, and I can see my ec tutorialpem file, which is the one I downloaded, as well as the ppk file, but this is not relevant. If you don't have it, this is fine. This is only if you want to use PuTTY. The only file that is of relevance for us is the ec tutorialpem file. Okay, so we need to make sure that on the security group, of course, we have the port 22 open for SSH, which we do. 
And next, we need to enter our SSH command. So for this, it is very similar to the one we have on Mac. So we do SSH minus I. Then you pass in the name of the tutorial file. So I did, to get this, I did EC2. And then I press tab. And I get auto-suggested the EC2 tutorial.pem file. If I press tab again, I can switch between PPK and, T and PEM. Okay, so by pressing tab, I get the autocomplete of this, so I do SSH minus I, or you can just type this, okay? And EC2 tutorial.pem, and then we need to type EC2 minus user at, and at, well, the public IP of my EC2 instance, which is right here, so I copy and paste it. So now this command is saying, please enter this IP using this user, the EC2 user, which is the one we have because we use Amazon Linux 2, using this key right here. So let's press enter. And it says, well, the authenticity of the host cannot be trusted. Do you want to continue? You say yes. And we are in the machine. So sometimes you will get permission issues, okay? So sometimes the permissions will not be happy, and I will show you how to fix them. So first, let's exit this and clear the screen. So in case you get a permission issue when running this command, what you have to do is to find your key. So for me, it's on my desktop. You right-click on your PEM file. You do properties. You go to the security tab, and this is where we're going to change permissions. So to do so, we're going to do advanced. And the first thing you need to make sure of is that the owner of this file is yourself. So it's working for me, but you can just click on change, okay? And then for object types, you can find yourself. Locations, make sure it's on your computer. And then type the object name. So it would be for me, Stefan, but I'm already an owner. So just type your name, and then you can be an owner of this file. The owner is also indicated in here, okay, in your uh, permission entries. The second thing you have to do is just remove these entities, so system and administrator don't need to have access to it, okay, and we need to disable inheritance. So first, let's disable inheritance. For this, we're going to remove all inherited permissions from this object. And then in here, I need to select a principal. So myself, I just go enter Stefan Merrick, okay. So as we can see, I did Stefan Merrick in here, check names, and this entered my principal name. And we're going to give myself full control over this. Press OK. So now the owner is myself, and the principal that owns that file is myself as well. We do OK and OK. So if I right-click again on this file and do properties under security now, I only see myself, Stefan Merrick, with full permission, OK? And then if you have that and you do this command again, for sure you will not have any permission issues and you will not be prompted with a yes, no question ever again. And if you wanted to, you could try this command. So let's exit this. Exit this. And we can, for example, open a command prompt. Go to my desktop. Again, if you don't go to the desktop, it will not work. And then paste in this command and it will work as well. You can do an SSH from the command prompt. So we've successfully seen how to SSH onto our EC2 instance directly from Windows. To exit, you can just type exit or do control D and we're good to go. And now we can get started with this course. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture. I want to show you an alternative to SSH that I found a lot easier, which is the EC2 instance connect. So for this, you click on my first instance and then you click on the top, it says connect. You have multiple options, including the SSH client we saw from before. But one option I want to show you is the EC2 Instance Connect. So this allows us to do a browser-based SSH session into our EC2 instance. For this, we verify the public IP address, which is good. The username is provided by default, which is EC2 user, because it got guessed by AWS that we are using Amazon Linux 2, and therefore EC2 user is the right username. But if you wanted to, you could override it. But it doesn't work unless you enter EC2 user. So we'll leave it as is for now. And then, as you see, there is no SSH key option because, well, when we do connect to it, it's going to upload for us a temporary SSH key and establish a connection this way. So with this methodology, we don't even need to manage SSH keys, which I find lovely. So you click on connect and it's going to open a new tab. And very quickly, you are into your Amazon X2 AMI and you can start running some commands such as who am I, or ping google.com and as you can see everything is working 
So the cool thing about it is that, well, your session is in the browser instead of using a different um, command line interface, such as terminal and so on. And so you do ping google.com or do any kind of commands you want really on it without using the SSH utility beforehand. But in this course, if I say use SSH, you have either the option to use your own terminal and SSH or to use, for example, putty or to use the SSH command on Windows or to use, regardless of if you're on Windows, Linux or Mac, the EC2 Instant Connect. Now, this is relying on the SSH behind the scenes. So if I go, for example, to my instance, look at the security group and I want to edit the rules. So I click on my security group in here, the inbound rules, I'm going to edit them and I'm going to remove the SSH inbound rule. So I delete it and save the rules and then go back to my EC2 instances and I close this one and I'll try to establish a new EC2 instance connect. So let's connect. As you can see, this is not working because while well, there's a problem connected to your instance, the first thing is that you need to open the port 22. So back into my launch wizard, I can fix this. I will, I will edit the inbound rule, add the SSH rule from anywhere IPv4, save the rule. Let's go back in here. And just in case if it doesn't work for you, sometimes it's because you're using HTTP 6, uh, IPv6, excuse me. So therefore you need to do from anywhere IPv6 as well. So you need to add these two entries for your EC2 instance connect to work sometimes. Depends on your setup. So we're good to go. And now if we try to connect to the instance itself, so let's try to connect in here. Voila, we are into the instance, okay? So that was a quick demo of EC2 Instance Connect. I will use it a lot in this course. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, so let's practice using IAM roles for our EC2 instance. So at first, I'm going to connect to my EC2 instance. You can SSH or you can use EC2 Instance Connect if you wanted to. I will use EC2 Instance Connect because it's just going to be in my web browser and a little bit simpler. So back into my instance, we have EC2 user, uh, Instance Connect right here and we are in our EC2 instance. So as we can see, we are EC2 user at and the private IP. So regardless if you're using EC2 uh, Instance Connect or SSH through your terminal or whatever for the putty, then if you see this, we are at the same stage, okay? So now you can just do some Linux commands, for example, ping Google, and you can get some information out of Google. Uh, and I will do Control-C to go out of it, or issue any kind of Linux commands you want, okay? You don't need to know Linux command going into the exam, but this is just a Linux terminal available to you right now in the cloud. So we'll type clear to clear the screen, and next, we have to run some IAM commands. So the cool thing is that the Amazon Linux 2 AMI we're using right now comes with the AWS CLI. And so as we can see, it is installed. So what we can do is start using some commands. For example, AWS IAM list users. And if we do so, it says unable to look at credentials. You can configure credentials by using AWS configure. So we could indeed run AWS configure to configure the credentials and specify an access ID, a secret access key, and a region name. But this is a really, really, really bad idea. And the reason is that if we run AWS configure and enter our personal details onto this EC2 instance, then anyone else in our account could again connect to our EC2 instance, for example, using EC2 instance connect, and retrieve the value of these credentials in our instance, which is not what we want. This is something that's really, really bad. And so as a rule of thumb, never, ever, ever enter your IAM API key, so the access key ID and the secret access key into an EC2 instance. This is horrible. And if you see someone doing it, please show them this video. Instead, what we have to do is use IAM roles. So if you remember when we were in the management console, and we were in IAM, we had created an IAM role. So let's go back into the roles. We had this demo role for EC2 that had one policy attached called IAM read-only access. So we are going to attach this role onto our EC2 instance to provide it with credentials. Okay, so how do we do this? For this, we can go into security, and as you can see, there is no IAM role right now onto our instance. So what we can do is go back to our instances, action, security, and then modify IAM role. Here we have to choose an IAM role. So we have demo role for EC2 and click on save 
to attach this IAM role into our instance. So if we go back to security, now the IAM role attached to our instance is demo role for EC2. So the effect of this is that now, if we do AWS IAM list users and press enter, well, we are getting a response around the users from IAM. So as we can see, we did not run the command AWS configure, we just ran, well, attached an IAM role and ran this command and it worked. And as a proof, if we go into this role and detach this permission, so now it's gone, and run the command again, we're getting an access denied. So the role is really linked now to the EC2 instance, and this is how we provide AWS credentials to our EC2 instances, only, only through IAM roles, okay? So if we go back to IAM and we attach a policy to this role and go back to IAM read-only access, attach this policy, and then rerun the command, we get an access denied because sometimes it can take a little bit of time to propagate the changes from IAM into AWS, but if we run it one more time, we're getting the output we expect, which is what we want. So this is very important for you to understand this, use IAM roles for your EC2 instances. So this is hopefully good for you. I hope you like this hands-on and I will see you in the next lecture. Hi, and welcome to this lecture on EC2 instances purchasing options. So we've been using so far on-demand EC2 instances. They allow us to run instances on demand. That means they're good for short workloads. We get predictable pricing and we're going to pay by the second. But if you have different kind of workloads, you can optimize your discounts and your pricing by specifying it to AWS. For example, you can use reserved instances and you have one year or three years term and they're meant for long workloads. So if you know you're going to run a database for a long time, then a reserved instance is great. And if you want to have a flexible instance type, so for example, you want to change the instance type over time, then convertible reserve instances are for you. And by the way, don't worry, I'm going to do a deep dive in all of those over time. Okay, next we have savings plan. And savings plan are one and three years term. And they're more modern because instead of committing to a specific instance type, you commit to a specific amount of usage in dollars. And they're again for long workloads. Spot instances instead are meant for very short workloads. They're very, very cheap, but at any time you can lose these instances and that makes them less reliable. Dedicated host allows you to book an entire physical server and control instance placements. And dedicated instances means that no other customers will share your hardware. Finally, capacity reservations allow you to reserve capacity in a specific AZ for any duration. Now let's look at EC2 on demand. So you're going to pay for what you use. So that means that if you're using Linux or Windows, you're going to be getting a billing per second after the first minute, or for all the other operating systems, you're going to get a billing per hour. It has the highest cost, but no upfront payments and no long-term commitments. That means it's definitely recommended for a short-term and uninterrupted workload where you cannot predict how the application will behave. Now for reserved instances, and by the way, the numbers I show you can change over time, so I will not update this video every time, but it gives you an idea of what the numbers can be. So the reserved instances give you a 72% discount compared to on-demand, and you reserve a specific instance attribute. For example, the instance type, the region, the tenancy, and the OS. You specify a reservation period, one year or three years to get even more discounts, and whether or not you want to pay upfront, partially upfront, or not upfront. And all upfront, of course, gives you the maximum amount of discounts. In terms of the scope, do you want the scope to be into a specific region or a zone? That means reserve capacity in a specific AZ. And so you would use reserved instances for the steady state usage applications, for example, for a database. And you can buy or sell your reserved instances in a marketplace if you don't need them anymore. And there is a specific kind of reserved instances called the convertible reserved instance, which is allowing you to change the instance type, the instance family, the operating system, the scope, and the tenancy. And because you have more flexibility, well, you get a bit less discount, you get up to 66% discounts. So that's for reserved instances. And now you have the EC2 savings plans, which is to allow you to get a discount based on long-term usage, which is the same 70% as reserved instances. But instead, you're going to say, I want to spend $10 per hour for the next one, two, three years. And any usage beyond, 
the savings plan is going to be billed at the on-demand price. So with savings plans, you're locked to a specific instance family and region. For example, you say, I want to have M5 type of instance family in US East 1. But you're flexible across the instance size. So you can have M5 X large, M5 2 X large, and so on. The OS, so you can switch between Linux and Windows and so on. And the tenancy, you can switch between host, dedicated, and default. Now, for spot instances, they have the most aggressive discount, so up to 90% discounts compared to on-demand, but they are instances you can lose at any point of time because you define a max price you're willing to pay for your spot instances, and if the spot price goes over it, then you're going to lose it. So they're the most cost-efficient instances in AWS, and they're going to be very helpful if you have a workload that is resilient to failure. So what could they be? Well, it could be batch jobs, data analysis, image processing, any kind of distributed workloads or workloads that have a flexible start and end time. They're not suited for critical jobs or databases and the exam will test you on that. Next, we have dedicated hosts. So you get an actual physical server with EC2 instances capacity fully dedicated to your use case. And you want to have dedicated host in the use case of you have compliance requirements or you need to use your existing server-bound uh, software licenses that has a billing based on a per socket, per core, per VM software licenses. This is in these kind of use cases that you need to access the physical server and get a dedicated host. So for dedicated host, you get on demand, and you're going to get paid per second, or you can reserve them for one or three years. They're the most expensive option of AWS because you actually reserve a physical server. And so again, a use case is when you have a license, uh, a, a, a software that comes with a licensing model that is bring your own license, or if you have a company that has strong reg regulatory or compliance needs. We also have dedicated instances, and they're instances that runs on the hardware that's dedicated to you, which is different from the physical server. But you may share the hardware with other instances in the same accounts, and you have no control over instance placements. So. There's a difference between dedicated instances and host that is here. At the exam, honestly, it doesn't trick you into one or the other. But remember that dedicated instances mean that you have your own instance on your own hardware, whereas dedicated host, you get access to the physical server itself and it gives you visibility into the lower level hardware. Next, we have capacity reservations for EC2. So you can reserve on-demand instances in a specific AZ for any duration. And then you get access to the capacity whenever you need it. You have no time commitment, so you can reserve capacity or cancel your reservation at any time, and no billing discounts. The only purpose is to reserve capacity. So if you want to get billing discounts, you need to combine it with regional reserved instances or your savings plan. And you're charged at the on-demand rate whether or not you run instances. So that means that your reserve capacity, you're going to be paid for it, billed for it, and you know for sure that if you want to launch instances, they're going to be available. But if you don't launch them, you're still going to get charged. So they're very suitable for short-term uninterrupted workloads that need to be in a specific AZ. So it gets difficult to understand which purchasing option is right for me, especially if you are a beginner. But let me give you a summary. The first one is on-demand. So we'll take a resort as an analogy. And with on-demand, you have a resort and you come in whenever you like, and whenever you like, you pay the full price. For reserved, well, you like to plan ahead and you know you're going to stay a very long time in your resort, one to three years, and then you're going to get a good discount because we know you're going to stay a long time. Savings plan is saying, hey, I know for sure that in my resort, I'm going to spend a specific amount. So I'm going to spend maybe... $300 per month every month for the next 12 months. And therefore, you may want to choose, uh, change the room type over time. So King, Suite, Sea View, and so on. But the savings plan is saying, hey, you're going to commit to a specific spending in your hotel. Spot instances are whenever the hotel runs a very last minute discounts because they have empty rooms and they want to attract people. So they get empty rooms and people bid on getting this empty room. And so you get very, very discounts. Uh, but in this specific resort, well, you can get kicked out at any time if someone is willing to pay more uh, for your room than what you did, okay? But <laughs> I don't want to stay in such a resort. Dedicated host is saying, hey, I want to book the entire building 
of the resort. So you get your own hardware, your own resort. And then capacity reservation is saying, I'm going to book a room. I'm not even sure if I don't stay in, but I know that if I want to stay in, I will have it. And you will pay full price for booking that room nonetheless. In terms of price comparison, I've just put together this table to give you one example at one point of time. So I took an M4 large in US East 1, and the on-demand price is 10 cents, but then the spot price is going to be up to, for example, 61% off in my example. Then if you want to reserve your instance, as you can see, you have different pricing if you wanted to have one year for three years and pay no upfront or all upfront. Same for the EC2 savings plan. We see that it is the same as the reserved instance discounts. We also get reserved convertible instances and we have dedicated host, which is at the on-demand price. The dedicated host reservation, which is up to 70% off because you reserve your host and capacity re reservation again at the on-demand price. So the exam will ask you to just know which type of instance is the right one based on your workloads. And by now you should have some good hints and don't worry, we will practice this over time. All right, that's it for this lecture. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next lecture. Now, again, one more reminder into the shared responsibility model and how this applies for EC2. So AWS is going to be responsible for all the data designers, their infrastructure and the security of them. Then AWS is going to be responsible for making sure you have high isolation on the physical host if you're getting, for example, a dedicated host or replacing faulty hardware if one of their servers is failing or making sure they are still compliant with the regulations that they have agreed to. But you as a user, you're responsible for the security in the cloud. So that means that you define your own security group rules and this allows you or other people to access or not your EC2 instances. You own the entire virtual machine inside of your EC2 instance. So that means that your operating system, would it be Windows or Linux, all the patches and the updates, you have to do them, not AWS. AWS gave you the virtual machine. It's up to you to handle it the way you want. That means that all the software and the utilities that are installed on this EC2 instance also are yours to be responsible for. Finally, understanding how to assign IAM roles and make sure the permissions are correct. And finally, making sure the data is secure on your instance is also very important for your EC2 instances. So that's it. Hope that again puts a bit of perspective onto the shared responsibility model for EC2. And I will see you in the next lecture let's do a summary on what we learned for EC2. So we have created EC2 instances and they were composed of an AMI, which was defining the operating system. Then we defined an instance size where we defined how much CPU power we want and how much RAM we want. We described the storage for our EC2 instance. We defined the firewall on our EC2 instance with the security groups. And finally, a bootstrap script called the EC2 user data that was started when the EC2 instance was started. So the security groups are attached to EC2 instances and they are a firewall outside of your instance. And you can define rules to allow which ports and which IP can access your EC2 instance. For EC2 user data, this was a script that we launched at the first start of an instance that we used to set up our EC2 instance to be a web server and say hello world. SSH was our way for us to start a terminal from our computers into our EC2 instances to start issuing commands on port 22. And once we did it, we were able to leverage an EC2 instance role that was similar to an IAM role to have our EC2 instance issue commands against IAM. In terms of the EC2 purchasing options, we have multiple options you need to know for the exam. We have on-demand, spot, reserved in three flavors, so standard, convertible, and scheduled. We have dedicated host, and finally, dedicated instances. So that's it. I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next section.